the historical discovery of the largest mass murder in human history, and the philosophical discovery that modernist culture had been powerless to stop that barbarism, made change imperative. As Theodore Adorno writes, in the last of the three quotes on this page, to write poetry after Auschwitz is barbaric, which is not to say that art should not happen, but that it must engage in a struggle against the barbarism of the culture that allowed the Holocaust to happen. However, a new war started almost as soon as the old one had ended, Churchill's quote at the top attesting to the realisation of this fact. Moreover, this war developed the potential to annihilate the entire species. The second quote on this page from Joseph Stalin translates as Atomic bombs frightened people with weak nerves. The Cold War became the focus of the struggle of culture against barbarism and paradoxically made the struggle barbaric. Abstract Expressionism was a school of art which emerged just after the Second World War. To criticise it for not engaging with the struggle against barbarism is to not take account of its gestation period. Sadly, it was finally born into a world that no longer needed it for its original purpose. As the name implies, Abstract Expressionism was a synthesis of Expressionism's lyrical representation of the innermost feelings of the subject, with abstractions opposition to traditional forms. Abstract Expressionism is, for me, very much the swan song of modernism's quest for spiritual truths through a rejection of space or facture. Abstract Expressionist works approach the infinite and the sublime, but they are ultimately romantic expressions of the individual at a time when, according to Adorno, such a lack of engagement with history was barbaric. That said, if it's possible to ignore the time in which they were made, they are truly beautiful works. Jackson Pollock, through his personal struggle with alcoholism and chain smoking, and an engagement with Jungian psychology and with Native American culture encountered in his childhood, dripping paint from sticks onto the floor canvas to record a trance-like dance in a transcendental state, a little like a surrealist artist doing automatic writing. Subject to the same caveats, Barnett Newman's canvases are more about the effect on the viewer and inspiring the sublime and the infinite through the scale and homogeneity of the canvases, which don't allow the eye to rest. Newman also engaged with Native American culture, having felt a sense of profound presence when he had encountered Indian burial mounds in the middle of a vast, empty landscape. And it was this sense of presence that he said he wished to recreate in his canvases. The same problems apply to Mark Rothko's work. There are certainly expressions of an inner mood or feeling in the modernist vein. It must be said that, as a left-wing Jewish intellectual who had left his native Europe for America, the sense of tragedy inherent in Rothko's works is an engagement with recent history. Rothko found post-war America's self-gratification offensive. This work, had been commissioned for the Four Seasons restaurant in the Seagram building in New York. After returning from a trip to Europe, Rothko visited the restaurant and promptly repaid the commission fee and gave the work to the Tate. There were parallels in European art with the intensified subjectivity of American abstract expressionists, but with radically different results. Jean de Buffet's subjectivism took an interest in outsider art, by children or the mentally ill, and his philosophical approach to painting, which has elements in common with Sartre's existentialism, broke down barriers between the artist and the object, and was known as art brut. There was a similar subjective approach in the works of Francis Bacon. As the title of this work implies, it shows some of the people present at Christ's execution. Some people went as his followers, Others, because they were following orders. Others, because what they felt inside compelled them to watch pain, mutilation and death. Francis Bacon had spent some time in Berlin in 1928. Prussia, in the time of the Weimar Republic, had become known for its tolerance of homosexuality, and Berlin in particular famous for its gay clubs. That changed horrifically in 1933. 
Though not specifically a response to history, this work was first exhibited in the Lefebvre Gallery in April 1945, the month of the liberation of Buchenwald, Bergen-Belsen, Dachau and Ravensbrück, where thousands of homosexuals had been murdered by the Nazi regime. John Russell, who was present at the Lefebvre Gallery show, describes Bacon's three figures perfectly. Half human, half animal, ears and mouths they had, but two at least were sightless. The left-hand figure had the hairstyle of a female jailer. It had what might have been mutilated wing stumps. Common to all three figures was a mindless capacity for hatred. Arguably, all these artists were responding to history, but in formal terms were still working in the modernist tradition which assumed that it was useful and even possible to express some inner truth of the artist, when in fact these inner truths were perfectly compatible with barbarism, and the forms they used, inherited from pre-war culture, were becoming incapable of rendering the complexities of this reality. The modernist project itself in its critique of form, found the solution to the problem it posed. Various solutions were found from various quarters, but they all come under the term of postmodernism. In linguistics, Ferdinand de Saussure had emphasized the way in which meaning in language is created by its structure as a whole, the conclusions from which were drawn by post-structuralists, namely that the relationship of a language to reality is arbitrary. This is particularly true of subjective reality. Ludwig Wittgenstein had made the same argument. If we all have something in a matchbox that we call a beetle, but we can't see inside anyone else's box, how can we know what the word beetle actually means? The post-structuralists focused on the way in which language is a cultural product. And as Marx had said, culture is created by the rulers. Hence the inheritance of language, including the language of inherited traditions of art, would always condition us to think in the mindset of whoever controls society. If you wish to critique a facet of that society, you must critique the language through which art operates. This slide is a summary of the key differences between modernist and postmodernist artworks. Please pause the video to read the text. This artwork, a tin, containing what purported to be 30 grams of excrement produced by the artist Piero Manzoni was sold in 1961 for the price of 30 grams of gold. Manzoni is doing several things here. This is a critique of the modernist idea that the value of art is in the uniqueness of the creation of the artist and the expression of the artist's innermost self. Hence Manzoni purportedly expressed into a can 30 grams from deep within himself, of something uniquely his own. The scatological element is partly a tribute to Duchamp's urinal, which as a found object has its parallel in something which Mansoni has, well, created or found. The Dadaist element is also repeated in that no one knows if the can contains the artist's excrement or not. Perhaps the tins are full of beetles. In a sense, this is a critique of the art market itself, or indeed any speculative market. What were Lehman Brothers subprime mortgage tranches actually worth? Yes, exactly. Just not in a can. But there's another twist. In 1961, the price of 30 grams of gold, and hence a can of Mansoni's artwork, was $37. The current price of 30 grams of gold is one thousand three hundred and thirty eight pounds and ninety pence, whereas Mansoni's tins sell for around two hundred and fifty thousand pounds. In a sense, then, this fact has undervalued the phrase behind Mansoni's work that it's worth its weight in gold. Perhaps the idea itself is worth much more than gold. Question. Which celebrity factory owner was the subject of a song by David Bowie, directed several films, survived a shooting, and was manager of an underground band? Underground is a big clue. Okay, so the band was the Velvet Underground, 
The Factory was a tinfoil lined art studio in New York, originally near Hell's Kitchen, afterwards near Union Square. The shooter was Valerie Solanus, and the song by David Bowie was entitled Andy Warhol. So before we've even started to talk about Andy Warhol's pop art painting, we can see that his work spreads into the American culture of celebrity and mass media. Warhol trained as a commercial artist, and his work has a kind of mechanical superficiality, eventually rejecting the paintbrush for silkscreen printing. But was this superficiality a critique of consumerist culture? On the surface, no. This work that you can see now, Coke bottles, echoes a statement Warhol made about what he saw as being great about America, the seemingly democratic element of capitalism. The richest consumers buy essentially the same thing as the poorest. You can be watching TV and see Coca-Cola, and you can know that the president drinks Coke, Liz Taylor drinks Coke, and just think, you can drink Coke too. A Coke is a Coke, and no amount of money can get you a better Coke than the one the bum on the street is drinking. All the Cokes are the same, and all the Cokes are good. And yet there is a divorce of the represented superficial appeal of, for example, Warhol's replicated images of Marilyn Monroe, and with the tragic facts of her life and death. In this sense, Warhol is a proto-postmodernist, insisting that there is no deeper reality than the superficiality of the inherited language of the consumerist system. He seems to be saying that there is nothing outside this system of images, and its meaning, its value, is the currency of mass communication, of fame, and their ability to convert into capital, just as Warhol's canvases do. Another rejection of the romantic biographical approach of the abstract expressionists, developed from purely abstract art such as Malevich's and the rejection of individual craft, as did Duchamp. The neo-Dada work we saw earlier by Manzoni had parodied the idea of the artist as a craftsperson. Manzoni's cans were from his father's canning factory. After a canoeing trip in New England in 1965, Carl Andre decided to reduce minimalist sculpture to a flat surface and to use materials whose only detailed variations were from nature or factory smelting and were not the artist's craft work. These attempts to eschew the production of an art object led to conceptual art and the complete dematerialization of the work. This was done in essence by citing the actual artwork within the idea itself, with little or no craft at all done by the artist, and with the works often executed by the public. This is the case with Yoko Ono's collection of conceptual works entitled Grapefruit, which involves a set of instructions for the reader to create, such as the ones seen here, or with others, instructions to enact artworks, often involving a particular state of mind of the reader, such as this, from spring 1963. Cloud piece. Imagine the clouds dripping. Dig a hole in your garden to put them in. Land art developed out of such conceptual and performance art, and the works of the British artist Richard Long, as a similar challenge to modernism, have no real product, nor do the audience view the performance of the work, only the documentation recording the event, which is then displayed in the gallery. Richard Long walks pre-selected routes in nature, sometimes interacting with the landscape by making ephemeral drawings in the grass or soil, or merely recording things he saw along the way. I spoke at the beginning of this video of how the Cold War became the focus for the struggle against barbarism, either in the form of totalitarianism or imperialism, and yet became barbaric in its own way. The title of the work, And Babies, is an extract from an interview with Paul Meadlow regarding the events in Son Mai village in Vietnam on the morning of the 16th of March 1968. Son Mai is more commonly known by its designation on US military maps, Mai Lai. 
approximately 400 unarmed civilians of all ages, hence the title of the work, were killed by two companies of U.S. Army troops. Theorist Pierre Bourdieu talked of how art museums have front steps, which you must ascend to enter, like those of a temple, in order to give art galleries a religious aura of unassailable authority. He also talked of how divisions in society between rulers and ruled were maintained using high culture. The Art Workers' Coalition, a left-wing collective of artists, produced the poster and babies, using a photo of the massacre taken by a U.S. Army photographer to make a protest to the New York Museum of Modern Arts Board of Trustees, in particular against Nelson Rockefeller, who they claimed used art as a disguise, a cover for his brutal involvement in all spheres of the war machine, referencing Rockefeller business interests in the production of napalm and arms. Joseph Boyce has been described as a synthesis of two archetypal images of the artist, that of Shaman and that of Trickster. Boyce was a trickster in that he invented a mythological explanation for elements of his art that simply weren't true. He venerated the materials of fat and felt, using these materials in his installations and sculptures, along with other spiritual materials such as copper. Referencing an event in the Second World War, when his Messerschmitt was shot down over the Crimea, and he was kept alive by Tatar tribesmen who wrapped him in fat and felt to keep him alive. This event was, in fact, fiction, but presented as fact by the artist. Boys was a shaman, on the other hand, in that he was deeply concerned with green issues, a founding member of the Green Party in Germany, a lecturer in art, he exhibited in galleries his written blackboards as works of art. This work, I Like America and America Likes Me, from May 1974, is a performance artwork in which he was carried, wrapped in felt, from the airplane at JFK to a waiting ambulance without touching US soil, his only engagement with the country through being locked in the René Block gallery with his felt blanket, his walking stick, a wild coyote and 50 copies of the Wall Street Journal. The coyote obligedly joined in the spirit of the work by urinating on the stack of newspapers. Cindy Sherman's works are an eloquent illustration of the way in which the language of images, including those of art, belong to a language created by the rulers of society, which in a patriarchy are males. Hence, female identities under the system are created as fictional works by men for women to inhabit. Sherman photographs herself in a variety of roles, created identities, like images from films or television, including advertising, referencing the importance of these media as a potent means of social conditioning. The images are poetic, allowing the viewer to supply a background story to the images. In a parallel of the way, we furnish our own fictionally created identities with content dictated by a culturally created framework. 